cannabis common sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. And welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. Our show is a production of our nonprofit organization, which is the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation, or the acronym THCF, and its affiliated political committee, the Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp, or CRRH. We have a great show for you tonight. Uh, Mr. Will Flowers is here with our uh, friend Tim Pate, and they're going to be singing some songs here. Uh, Mr. Don Dupay is here. We'll be talking about further events and opinions, and uh, we've got some hip news and some other exciting things. We'll be taking your phone calls in just a little bit, so stay tuned. And we'll start out, as we always do, with our infamous Dancing Cannabis Leaves. Tonight's first story is from the Big Island of Hawaii, from the Tribune Herald, written by uh, one of their staff writers, Jason Armstrong. Hawaii's county controversial pot eradication program is going up in smoke, responding to citizen complaints of privacy intrusions and the alleged police harassment of people. The city council voted 5-4 to four Wednesday against spending $582,000 for the Green Harvest helicopter operations. According uh, to Councilman Bob Jacobson on the Big Island, he said, quote, I just think it's time to stop this marijuana war, end quote. Jacobson's a longtime critic of the eradication program. Voting against the program were Jacobson Hamakawa and Councilman Dominique Yagong. South Kona Councilman Brenda Ford, Puno Woman Councilman Emily Neal, and Hilo Councilman Stacy Higa. The uh, members uh, Yashimoto and Ikita joined Chairman Pete Hoffman of Kahoa and North Kona Councilman Angel Palago to vote for continuing to fund uh, cannabis raids. The swing vote was cast by Higa, who expressed reservations about turning down the federal grants. Assistant Police Chief James Day told the lawmakers, quote, we've always accepted the money, end quote. The program started more than 20 years ago. All three grants include money to rent private helicopters that police use to search for cannabis plants, Day said. Another portion pays for informant information and to buy drugs, he said. Uh, according to Higa, he says, quote, it's going to curtail our activities as far as the eradication of marijuana goes, he said. Council members voted to remove the money from the next fiscal year's operating budget. That action won't be final, however, until lawmakers again vote to approve the countywide budget and send it to the mayor of the Big Island, Harry Kim, to consider signing it a law. That second vote's expected at the council's June 1st meeting in Hilo. The county hasn't received the money, but it expected to get the grants, so the funding is included of uh, the proposed countywide budget that starts July 1st. The green harvest money can still be added later should lawmakers reverse course and accept the eradication grants, she added. Getting future grants will be harder since that money's been shifted to other states, according to the sheriff, Day. Uh, the council's vote won't stop the DEA Drug Enforcement Administration from conducting helicopter raids, Prosecutor Jay Kamura told the lawmakers. Kamura said, quote, whether the council accepts the money or not, eradication would continue, noting that marijuana is illegal under federal law. That prompted Akita to vote against rejecting the money, which she added cannot be shifted to combat crystal methamphetamine, a drug locally known as ICE. Anyway, uh, it looks like uh, there's some move forward on the Big Island of Hawaii to uh, reject the DEA's uh, funding for the drug war, and that's a good move for freedom in America. Our next story is from Berlin, Germany, and the, it's a new study out that says cannabis may improve brain function in certain schizophrenics. Cannabis use is associated with improved cognition in schizophrenic patients, according to clinical trial data to be published in the journal Progress in neuropsychopharmacology 
and biological psychiatry. Investigators at the University of Berlin assessed the impact of cannabis on cognitive function in schizophrenic patients who reported prior use of cannabis versus patients who reported no history of substance abuse. The researchers reported that cannabis use was not associated with any decline in cognition and that those subjects who reported using marijuana prior to their first psychotic episode showed improved cognitive performance on certain tests compared to non-users. The investigators concluded, quote, to our surprise, cannabis abusing schizophrenic patients achieved results either similar to those achieved by non-using cannabis schizophrenic patients or at times performed even better than them. Rather than deteriorating neuropsychological performance, cannabis use prior to a patient's first psychotic episode improved cognition in some tests, end quote. According to the study's authors, cognitive dysfunctions are present in more than 80% of patients diagnosed with schizophrenia. A separate 2005 study by the investigators at Manchester's Metropolitan University in Britain previously reported that schizophrenic patients who consumed cannabis prior to disease onset possessed greater cognitive skills after 10 years than did non-users. Neurocognitive studies performed on healthy volunteers generally report that the use of marijuana, even long-term, is not associated with any significant or long-lasting declines in cognitive function. The full text of this study, cannabis induces different cognitive changes in schizophrenic patients and in healthy controls, end quote, will appear in a forthcoming issue of Progress in Neuropsychopharmacology and Biological Psychiatry. Our next story tonight is from Olympia, Washington, and this is some legislation that I'm happy to say is passed. Washington Governor Chris Gregoire signed Senate Bill 6032 into law last week, amending Washington State's nearly nine-year-old medical cannabis measure. Fifty-nine percent of state voters initially approved the law in 1998, which enacts statewide legal protections for patients who use cannabis under the supervision of their physician. The amended law, which takes effect on July 22, 2007, mandates the State Department of Health to adopt rules defining the quantity of marijuana that could reasonably presume to be a 60-day supply for qualifying patients. The Health Department of Washington State is instructed to report its findings to the state legislature by July 1, 2008. Currently, patients may legally possess or cultivate up to a 60-day supply of marijuana for therapeutic purposes under Washington's law. Lawmakers have uh, never clarified how much cannabis legally constitutes a 60-day supply, instead leaving the issue to be interpreted subjectively by local law enforcement, which has led to a lot of problems. As amended, patients who possess larger quantities of cannabis than those approved by the department will continue to receive legal protection under the law if they're present, uh, if they can present evidence indicating that they require such amounts to adequately treat their qualifying medical condition. Senate Bill 6032 also affirms changes previously recommended by the state's Medical Quality Assurance Commission to expand the state's list of qualifying conditions to include Crohn's disease, hepatitis C, and any diseases including anorexia, which result in nausea, vomiting, wasting appetite loss, cramping, seizures, muscle spasms, and or spasticity when these symptoms are unrelieved by standard treatments or medications. The new law also limits the ability of police to seize medical cannabis that is, quote, determined to be possessed lawfully by an authorized patient under the law, end quote. That's a new twist, so the police, according to the new law, are forbidden to seize a patient's marijuana. Though Senate Bill 6032 was approved overwhelmingly by the legislature, Washington's medical marijuana patient community was strongly divided over the proposal, with many patient groups actively opposing the bill. The full text of Washington's amended medical cannabis law is available online at uh, www.leg.wa.gov. Just do a search for that, Senate Bill 6032. Our last story tonight is from Canada. The patient's access to legal medical cannabis supplies is thwarted by red tape up in uh, Canada, according to a new study. Past cannabis use may be detected in sweat for up to four weeks, according to another study. Uh, from Baltimore, the primary psychoactive ingredient in marijuana, THC, may be detected at low levels in the sweat of daily cannabis users for up to four weeks after they cease using the drug, 
according to clinical trial data published in the journal Forensic Science International. Investigators at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or NIDA, NIDA, assessed the sensitivity of a sweat patch technology in 11 daily cannabis users. All of the subjects tested positive for THC during their first week of abstinence, three tested positive for two weeks, and one subject continued to test positive for four weeks after ceasing his use of cannabis. By contrast, subjects administered daily doses of oral THC did not have a positive sweat patch result. Sweat patches consist of an absorbed cellulose pad that's applied to the skin with an adhesive and is generally worn by subjects for up to one week. The technology is primarily used in drug treatment and in criminal justice settings. The full text of this study, excretion of delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol in sweat, appears in the May issue of the journal Forensic Science International. So that's the end of our hip news segment tonight, and now we're going to listen to Tim Pate along with Will Flowers. How are you gentlemen doing tonight? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Will? Excellent, excellent. I think that uh, just to let you know, I have invited Will Flowers to be on our show tonight, and I'm going to step aside right now and let him play a song for us. Yeah. Welcome back. I'm just excited to be here, and thank Welcome you very much. Welcome back. Okay. Don't want to steal the show. The leaves are nice, but I like the flower. The leaves are nice, the leaves are nice, but I like the flower. Flowers are so beautiful. Don't you know that so are you? The leaves are nice, the leaves are nice, but I like the flower. Oh, the stems are fine, they stand in a line, they hold up the flower. Don't you know you got to have some stems holding your flowers and the leaves? I so group that I take all the sunshine in by. Oh, don't you know that don't really get it on like that kid the flower. You know the kid the flower. I so fine at the top of the vine. But a little bit of 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 a Leaves are nice, the leaves are nice, but I like the flower. Leaves are nice, the leaves are nice, but I like the flower. Flowers are so beautiful. I do when I stain your head. Leaves are nice, the leaves are nice, but like take my flowers to bed. Oh, look at that, you don't do that. Rubber do the thing. Oh, that seeds are pretty good, that seeds are pretty good, you know. <laughs> They're growing at the end, that little old seed will grow. What I'd like the seeds for is what comes out of that pod, baby. But you can't get it on. Seed pod, baby. Leaves are nice. Seeds are fine. The stems are divine. But the flowers get my heart most of the time. Well, the leaves are nice. The leaves are nice. I know time Leaves are so fine, you know I got to have my flowers all the time. Leaves are nice, leaves are nice, but I got to have my flowers. Leaves are nice, leaves are nice, but I got to have my flowers. Flowers are so beautiful, and don't you know that I so are you. Yeah, you're all so beautiful. Oh, the leaves are nice. The leaves are so fine. But I gotta have my flowers all the time. I gotta have my flowers. I gotta have my flowers. I gotta have my flowers. And God bless every one of you. Yeah. Yeah. 
right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Flowers. Thank you. All right. We'll be back with him in just a little bit. How are you doing this week, Don? Pretty good. An good. interesting week again, Paul. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the ancient Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. You know, that's the way it goes. And yes. so some of us are so blessed. And we continue to try to spin that in a positive manner. I want to welcome you to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense here. We are taking your phone calls. And if you have a question for us this night, the 18th of May, 2007, then you can call. If it's not Friday night, the 18th of May, don't try to call this number because you won't get an answer. If you call the other number, we won't be live on TV. We get calls like that. Yeah. You know, it's Tuesday afternoon. You guys are live on TV. I want to talk right now. You know, through video, it seems that way. But anyway, if you have a question for us tonight, that's the number to call, 503-288-4448. That's 503-288-4448. So we're uh, happy to announce that uh, uh, we are moving into the Bay Area in a pretty strong way with uh, um, some unfortunate news that Dr. Todd McCurria, who's been on this show yes. many times over the years and was at our Hempstock Festival last year, uh, is ha starting to receive home hospice care and has asked us to and some of our doctors to help take over his practice. So uh, Dr. Orvald, who's a guest on this show, is going to be down there in Berkeley, California, starting uh, the end of this month, May 29th and 30th, and starting to see patients there in McGarrea's uh, clinic and uh, our nonprofit, the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation is going to keep McGarrea's name established. You know, McGarrea was the first yeah. physician in California to advocate medical marijuana. He wrote a book back in the 70s on it and worked uh, on it with the National Institute of Mental Health during the 60s during the Kennedy administration. So he's a longtime expert. We're really sad about his health but uh, happy to be able to help his patients. That's a good thing. Dr. Micaria is a longtime uh, uh, hero of mine, Paul, and I'm glad yeah. this is happening this way. I first met him when I was 25 mm -hmm. and got him to autograph a uh, copy of his book back then, and he's been working to get out a sequel to that, a compilation of medical articles that are more recent. So hopefully we'll see that coming out. Fred Gardner, who's also been on this show, has mm -hmm. been working on him with that down in the Bay Area. But we have a phone call. Hello, caller. You're on the show. How you guys doing? Hey, Paul. Hey, Don. How you all doing? Hello. Very well, right. thanks. Um, you guys had a episode about maybe six months ago. A gentleman was on your show, and he was speaking about how you got a higher yield of hash using fresh leaves instead of the uh, dried-out leaves and bubble uh -huh. bags. And um, I was wondering, how, does he dry that, those out at all before he puts them in the freezer? Or yeah, he does. It, it 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 has to cure first, and the curing process helps the maturation of the the trichromes and the uh, cannabinoid profile. So they have to cure it first, even if it's just the leaf. Right. But I'm not sure of all the details. Huh? Because he was speaking about taking it right off the plant, put it in the freezer, and yeah, yeah, he did say that that would produce more. I haven't got the experience to say that. I remember that was Joe, Joe Pietro, yeah. Pietro, who had and he looked who like he had some pretty good the book, uh, the King of Hashish, who who lived there in Afghanistan and uh, uh, South Asia, and yeah, he did say that. I haven't tested it. Though, I haven't tested honest. it either. Well, I think I'm going to test it with some Sensi Star and some White Widow, something with some long stock trichomes. All right. It'll well, out. hopefully it'll go well. Just let us know. All right. I will. And uh, right. hopefully I'll have a sample for you guys. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good evening. You too. You, you know, one of the things with PHA's method, there's been several folks, including the, the medicine man, who's written mm -hmm. some articles on cannabis and helps us with our, our classes. He's been producing this hash that melts. It doesn't really burn, you know, yeah. and turn into a cinder. It just bubbles and melts and tastes really good. It's a lot higher quality than your, your standard hash. And, of course, that's really good for edibles for medical patients who need a THC dose. But uh, uh, it's, yes, uh, it's kind of state of the art. Yes, good hash. Does indeed. Does indeed. So if you have a question for us tonight, give us a call at 503-288-4448. That's 503-288-4448.
you know, we ran through the list of conditions just a moment ago. But, hey, we've got a caller. Let's take that first. Hello, caller. Uh, greetings. Brother Johnson again. Hey, Brother Johnson again. Yeah. Hello there, Detective Paul, uh, Detective DuPay. Hello. <laughs> yes, indeed. I still heard something from Leap. <laughs> now, hey, let me ask you a question now. Uh, I know your, your screener said that it has anything much to do with me, so but I'm still wondering and curious about uh, who it is that's trying to inquire about patients there. That's that's something really to look into. It's very important there to look into. And I also want someone to touch on about housing. Uh, the reason why I'm asking, because you know I'm in housing and I'm experiencing some pretty interesting little ordeals here. Let me give you an example. Someone just loves to come around my door when I burn incense. I know lately someone, someone's been complaining that they smell this is burning. Now those dirty dogs. <laughs> yeah, well, they, well, that's not the half of it. And now, uh, well, usually when they complain, I just lift the incense up about a minute, and they compl- <laughs> and they said they smell incense. They hadn't even had time to fluctuate yet. Now, how in the world are they gonna smell the incense and I just lit up in one minute? Now wait, here's another kicker now. Wait, Maybe they've got a out. hole drilled in your wall there or something. You know, wait, no, wait, check this out now. Uh, you know, we, I got a little peephole there in the, in the door. Yeah. And, you know, through that peephole, you know, you can see when someone's messing around the door, right? Yeah. yeah. I approach the door to look at, look into the situation, you know, investigate, the, you know, the problem. By the time I make it to the door, the subject, I mean, the people have, have left the area. Now, how in the world do they know I'm coming toward the door? <laughs> you know, you well, do the math on Brother that. Johnson, you can just... Try to rest sure that if they're wasting their time with you and they're not bugging anybody else, at least. Isn't that, that amazing? Now, um, I hope you guys touch on that and see if, you know, you're going to do anything about you know, All right. housing. And well, thanks for your call. Yeah, okay. Bye-bye. All right. Have a good evening. Okay. If you're out there and you have an actual question for us, give us a call at 503-288-4448. That's 503-288-4448. That's the number, right? I think yes, that's it. That's yep. it. Yeah. So, oh. yes. You know, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. <laughs> That's right. So, it's true. Know, I mean, it's always good to be cautious. You ought to think about looking into that peephole and maybe turn it around. It might be facing the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's hard to say. We know Brother Johnson in our office pretty well. He is quite the character. <laughs> uh, but nice overall. You can... Uh, we have another caller. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Hi, Paul and Don. I Howdy. just had a question about does restless leg syndrome qualify under the muscle spasms? You know, that would be a doctor call. I can't really. It would be up to your doctor. I think it might. I, I think there are patients who have received medical marijuana for that. Um, but, again, it would be something where the doctor would have to review the records and say, yeah, that's something I'm comfortable with, uh, looking at the, the record. The longer the diagnosis uh, sets it out for, the more likely I believe a physician would uh, agree to, to issue a permit for. Thank you, and I want to take this time to thank you guys for the information you bring. You're welcome. We're thank glad you. to do it. Thanks for saying so. I often say wild horses couldn't drag us away, and a few have tried. And they continue to try, they but, do. you know, that's okay. We were told that the federal prosecutor in Yakima watches this show online and doesn't like us. That's kind of an interesting little little stretch, but uh, he doesn't like us. I'm sorry, Mr. Haggerty. This is what free speech is all about in America, especially when the government's lying to us, the way it's been lying to us about marijuana, the way it lied to us to get us into the Iraq War, the way they keep lying to us about the Justice Department and the erosion of freedom and liberty here in America. I think once we legalize and regulate the sale of marijuana to adults, people can grow their own without a license. We'll see freedom really expand, especially as local economies take advantage of industrial hemp like it's used to make these food products right here, hemp, soy milk, uh, and chocolate and vanilla, and primarily biofuels and biodiesel fuel. That's the real key to marijuana prohibition, I think. But we have a caller. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Hi. My name is uh, Terry, and I had a question. I want to know, uh, I recently moved to Tigard, Oregon from Washington. My husband is HIV positive, and the laws in Oregon are kind of vague. I want to know, how do I become a caregiver 
for him. I also have a two-year-old son, and I just want to make sure that I do everything accordingly because I want to protect myself from authority. Sure. Well, the laws in Oregon are not vague. They're very, very concrete for medical marijuana. Now, they're pretty vague up in Washington State. They're pretty vague down in, in California, but Oregon's laws are pretty concrete. You get a doctor, a physician, who's either licensed as an MD, a medical doctor, or a DO, a doctor of osteopathy, to fill out a state form that uh, recommends medical marijuana, a physician statement, and that state form. Then the patient fills out a form and turns that into the state with a payment. Uh, it's $100 for most patients, but patients who are on financial assistance of one of two types, either the Oregon Health Plan or Social Security Supplemental Security Income, SSI, not SSD. But if you're on SSI or the Oregon Health Plan, then you qualify for a $20 annual fee through the State Health Department. Mm -hmm. Once you have turned that into the state, then you're a qualified patient and you can grow a total of 24 marijuana plants. Out of those 24 plants, six of them can be flowering, though they don't have to be, and aren't limited in size where 18 are considered starter plants and can only be a foot tall or a foot wide. You can also possess, legally, under Oregon state law, up to 24 ounces of medical marijuana. So it's really pretty concrete. 24 ounces is the largest amount allowed by any medical marijuana state, so we're pretty lucky here. That's a pound and a half or two ounces a month if you average it out over a year period of time. Right. So once oh, you've turned that paperwork oh. in, there's uh -huh. a section on there that states who the caregiver is. And the caregiver has to turn in uh, one of three forms of Oregon identification. And the patient has to also turn that in. And the person who's going to be responsible for growing marijuana has to fill out a criminal history background check. That okay. background check has to certify that the caregiver, the person who's going to be responsible for growing the marijuana, hasn't been convicted of a drug crime since January 1, 2006 any offenses before January 1st, 2006 don't count. So once all that's turned into the state, then everybody's legal under state law. Okay, that sounds great. And one more question is, um, my son is two years old, in, and I just want to make sure that I, if I cultivate in my home, that um, if, if there's anything, I don't want to do anything wrong. Certainly. Well, I'd be ha I've got children in the home as well. I'd be happy to explain how to not have any problem with that. One thing is never smoke marijuana in the presence of your child. Don't right. expose them to secondhand marijuana smoke. Right. Keep your marijuana under lock and key where no one can open it, especially at the age of two. You don't have to worry too much about him stealing it for at least a decade, right? Right. <laughs> so then... Uh, you want to make sure that they don't have access to the garden. Never allow the minor into the garden, and most assuredly, never have the minor help you with any tasks in the garden. Okay. And so, could, I, uh, could I put it on my balcony if I live in an apartment complex? No. No, because then it's <laughs> publicly, you've got to keep it out of public view. Out of public the, what view. What we always tell patients is, should your growing and consuming of cannabis has to be treated like sex. If it's not legal to have sex in that location, it's not legal to grow or consume cannabis in that location. So you well, have to keep it in a private location. Thank you very much. You've been very helpful. I'm glad to do that. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. You know, medical marijuana is now legal under state law across the western United States, and we're helping patients across the western United States yes. get medical marijuana permits right now. There are a number of conditions. The largest single category, of course, are patients with chronic pain. That accounts for over 60% of the people out there who have medical marijuana permits. Mm -hmm. Then patients with cancer, AIDS, uh, neurodegenerative diseases like ALS or multiple sclerosis and other conditions that cause uh, muscle spasms, seizure disorders like epilepsy, uh, gastrointestinal diseases like GERD or Crohn's disease or IBS, hepatitis C, which causes nausea and uh, pain, and glaucoma. All of those conditions qualify for medical marijuana across the United States, and, or across the 12 states that allow medical marijuana currently. Excuse me. They're not the majority of states, unfortunately. But in the state of California, there are a number of other conditions that don't qualify 
in Oregon and Washington, and those conditions are mainly psychiatric ones like uh, depression, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, bipolar conditions. Those all qualify in California, and as we were talking about Micaria, Micaria was a psychiatrist mm -hmm. by training who went to college here in Portland at, at Reed during his undergraduate days. But all those conditions are legal in California, but not the other states. So if you or someone you know is looking for a doctor referral, we have doctors in Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Colorado, and Hawaii, who we'd be happy to uh, refer you to. Just call our office here in Portland. The number is 503-235-468. Zero six. That's five zero three two three five four six zero six. Up in Seattle, we have a different number. It's two zero six eight seven eight seventeen zero one. That's two zero six eight seven eight seventeen zero one. We have a number in Denver, Colorado. And this show plays in Denver every Saturday night now on Channel fifty eight at ten thirty, and it is the number in Denver is three zero three four zero three ninety nine ninety six. That's three zero three. 403-9996. And if you're outside of Portland, Denver, or Seattle, you can call us on our toll-free number. That's 1-800-723-0188. 1-800-723-0188. So there's that plug. I'm reading today's paper along the edge where the editor is right at the very bottom. It says, marijuana is the largest cash crop in America. Imagine that. I think it's I time to legalize that. it and tax it and see industrial hemp mm -hmm. get up there so it can displace the petrochemical industry. You yeah. know, hemp produces three times more seed oil and biodiesel fuel than any other seed crop, and the byproduct of producing biodiesel from hemp is three tons of high-protein hemp seed meal, yes. like this stuff right here, and 20 tons of hemp bast fiber for paper and building materials and six to eight tons of uh, uh, the, the outer s uh, bark of the hemp uh, plant, uh, which is good for canvas, rope, lace, and linen. So that's the byproduct of making hemp for fuel, and I think that's the main reason it's illegal. We have another caller, though. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Would that be me? That, that is you. you. All right. <laughs> um, I believe last week you read a statistic from a Canadian survey. Uh, amount about the amount of marijuana that patients they survey smoke or consume per day. Do you remember that? I do. It was 2.2 grams a day okay. by AIDS patients in, in Canada. Yeah. Th that seems like a good therapeutic amount. It does. It seems like plenty to last a day, that's for sure. And about the right amount, about, you know, half of an eighth, a little more than half of an eighth. Right. Some of our camera crew back here thinks that's not enough. <laughs> you never know. Every patient's different, and uh -huh. every human being is different. And that's the bigger true. picture of legalization overall. I'll tell you, 2.2 grams a day is more than I need. You know? I also have a suggestion for the gallon. Yeah, if you're going to eat it, though, you're going to need more. That's another. And you, if you don't want the buzz, you can just eat the leaf and, and take like a, a 3 gram, 4 gram dose of leaf and. That's going to not get you high, but take care of pain, spasms, and seizures with the CBD content in the leaf, where, you know, if you want the buzz, it's the THC in the flowers that you want to consume, where if you just want the relief from the pain without the, the psychoactive effect of cannabis, you want to consume the leaf, and that has just as much CBD in it as the flowers, and it's the CBD that's useful for pain, spasms, and seizures. Right, right. Um, the, I wanted to su make a suggestion for the gal who called in about restless leg syndrome. That's mm -hmm. often a part of a larger number of syndromes that are eligible. But for every patient who has their doctor sign the form, have the doctor add anything that he thinks that it's going to help because that's going to help those diseases get on and be covered in the future. Mm -hmm. All right. Good point. All right. Keep it up. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your for call. calling. We have a film clip now. We're going to roll, and we'll be back in just a second. So stay tuned. Don't touch that dial. We'll be back. Save the world. With no self-respecting person will come to the marijuana movement. They'll think they're going to involved with a nut like you. All the world of a
thick-skinned and unrelenting, Jack ignored the naysayers and stuck to his guns. Late in 1979, he and Captain Ed opened the nation's first hemp store, an outdoor stand famous to this day, where else but Venice Beach, California. Overnight, Jack became a boardwalk fixture, the hemp merchant of Venice, a man of hemp and cloth preaching the gospel. He's interested in saving the damned world and informing everyone he knows about hemp. He wears it on his body. He can't stop to buy a hot dog without starting to spread the news. He's been doing this continually. Now, when a guy like this is more like an Armenian rug merchant on the Lower East Side or something. You know what I mean? He's, he's straight off the Bowery. He, he's a working class guy. As the 80s began, and the country braced itself for an official policy of zero tolerance toward marijuana. Jack was about to have a close encounter with the 40th president of the United States. January 1981, West Los Angeles, California. Mere days before the presidential inauguration, Jack and a small encampment of followers are campaigning for California hemp and marijuana initiatives. Along comes Ronald Reagan. President-elect Reagan's motorcade pulls up to the federal building. He's scheduled for a pre-inaugural haircut. According to eyewitnesses, great communicator questions the building manager. By the way, he says, what are the Canadians protesting about out there? And uh, he thought that the marijuana flag we were flying out there was the maple leaf. <laughs> and, he, and, and the guy who's the manager of the office of the building, he says, well, he's, they're, they're, not, they're not Canadians. Those are marijuana protesters. And Reagan says, well, isn't there something you can do about that? Well, we've taken them to court and they've won. Well, I'll be on duty in five days. I'll see what I can do for you. What Reagan does is have Jack and five others arrested for violating an arcane wartime sabotage act. The others pay a $5 fine and get probation. Jack fights. He refuses to pay the fine and loses. His appeal is unsuccessful. The United States Supreme Court refuses to hear the case. So on July 14th, 1983, Jack reports to federal prison at Terminal Island, California. There was a lot of bank robbers in federal prison in 1983. And, um, there I went, what are you in here for? Um, I was registering voters after dark <laughs> on federal property. <laughs> they put you in jail. <laughs> Running for the border, spinning to the light. Frozen night on wonder, and a holy terror inside. I smell the river. Jack's incarceration would have been insignificant except for the fact that he finally had the time and solitude to begin writing another book. There was no radio, there was no television, no movies, no nothing to distract me. A couple guys would sing gospel songs a, a cappella, but that was, that was about it. I knew that Jack Herrera's book was going to become an underground classic. I knew it right away from the first time I saw the first edition. People opened that book and said, you can make food out of hemp seed oil, you can burn it in a lamp, you can make rope, uh, you can make parachute cordage and tie your shoes, and the Constitution was really printed on hemp paper. I mean, people love that. In 1985, Jack published The Emperor Wears No Clothes. Since then, the book has gone on to become an underground phenomenon selling more than 600,000 copies worldwide.
and is now in its 11th edition. The first populist book of its kind, The Emperor Wears No Clothes, is part scientific document, part journalistic expose, and part holy crusade. It takes us on a journey of discovery that provides a caustic, sarcastic, and often irreverent look at the forgotten history and economic potential of the hemp plant. Written in simple and scholarly detail, its pages are filled with numerous articles, historical documents, photographs, and diagrams. All right. Yeah, that's exciting. I'm always happy to get an opportunity to tell our viewers that the first edition of that book was written right here in River City in Portland, Oregon, in my home. Jack uh, had three little kids, and in that day and age, we didn't have computers in mm -hmm. 1985 to put books together with, so it was cut and paste, and you had stacks of paper that you'd have to cut and paste, and so he needed a place to do it at, and I happened to have a lot of room in my house. I didn't have family at the time, so I actually started doing research on it, that later was added into Jack's book and became the final chapter of Chris Conrad's book, Hemp Lifeline to the Future. Found just a ton of quotes from uh, Washington and Jefferson and Franklin in Portland State University's library, uh, that great research site, yes. you know. And that later became uh, the first time it was used in that context, actually. We have another caller, though. Hello, caller, you're on the show. Yeah, yeah. You guys had a, a, a guy on your show about uh, making hash without the bubble bags. Yeah. Um, we were talking about him just a minute ago. Joe Pietri, oh, the yeah, king of in. hash, or uh, what, King of Nepal. That was the name of his book. Okay. And uh, he has a nifty little device at? that we have one of down at our uh, Portland office that, uh, in fact, makes very high-quality hash. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I'd, I'd yeah. like to pick up the book. The book, King of Nepal by Joe Pietri out there it's all about his uh, forays in during the 70s and early 80s uh, in South Asia oh wow okay oh I'll, I'll stop and pick one up all right great thank you thank you bye 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 if you have a question for us call that number there on your screen 503-288-4448 we'll be taking your calls for about another 15 minutes or so we're gonna do a little show and tell or sharing as they say these days have a number of nifty new medicinal cannabis bottles added to the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation's collection. This one is from Specific Medicines in Columbus, Ohio, and it's just cannabis. The text on this bottle is hilarious. I'll try to read a little bit from it in a moment. It's got a nifty backlight cap with their logo on it for Lloyd Brothers and Specific Medicines. This next one is really unique. It's for migraines. Can you see it right there on there? Migraines. It's from Sharpen Dome. That's another company that's still around. We've got two from companies that still exist. Sharpen Dome is morphed and it has cannabis, extracted cannabis as one of its uh, ingredients for migraines. We had a question about that last week. And this one is from Park Davis. It says right there, Park Davis. And it's cannabis tincture. Uh, and that these about a pint bottle there. Another nifty. We have several of these. This is the most recent acquisition. We probably have about four or five of these Park Davis pint bottles in the THCF collection right now. This label is uh, not the best example by far, but very legible. And right next door, we have some hemp milk that is distributed here in the River City, Portland, Oregon, and it's made up in B.C. There's chocolate. I drank most of this. And we have vanilla, which is going to some of the folks in the control room who I'm sure are going are to gratefully it. consume it very quickly, as soon as possible, after this show. So, Don, do you have an editorial for us this week? I do, Paul. We have... Uh I'm talking just a little while ago about the rogue government and all the crap they're doing, and I wanted to remind people about one of the activists, longtime activists in San Diego who killed himself a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't want to let his name die, and I wanted to talk about him a little bit tonight. Steve McWilliams killed himself in San Diego, and I'll tell you why. If a government holds, if a hospital holds needed medicine from a patient, and that patient suffers more or dies, then who's liable? What if the medicine withheld treats the patient for depression? 
What if not only if the medicine was withheld, but the patient was threatened to go to jail for using it? What if, denied the medication for depression, the patient became so depressed he killed himself? What if, if it wasn't a hospital that did this, it was a San Diego, California judge? Of course I'm talking about the suicide death of longtime San Diego activist Steve McWilliams. I didn't know him personally, but I sure wish I could have met him. I admire him for his actions against a disgusting, cold-blooded, murderous government. Steve McWilliams wasn't secretive about what he did. Us activists aren't. He was in your face. He smoked marijuana on the steps of the San Diego City Hall to call attention to his medical properties. And he grew 25 plants in his front yard. For 25 plants, he was arrested and sentenced to 40 years in prison. And finally, his last act of defiance against this government was to take his own life, saying essentially to the world, screw you, I don't want to be here anymore. It is our misgoverning government that is responsible for his death. I'm reminded too of a story a couple of years ago about a 27-year-old quadriplegic. His name was Jonathan Magby. He died while serving 10 days in a Washington, D.C. jail. He was a medical user, but he was unable to present a medical defense. In Washington, D.C., 69% of the voters approved medical marijuana. Jonathan was in chronic pain and unable to breathe on his own. The judge insisted that he be locked up to teach this quadriplegic a lesson, I suppose. The jail, now unwilling or unable to furnish him his medicine, allowed him to die while in custody. Why, after 69% of the voters in Washington, D.C. approved medical marijuana, has it never been implemented? Because every year when Congress does the budgeting, they vote to reestablish the federal law that prevents the D.C. initiative from taking effect. What that is, is the federal government saying, we don't care what the voters said, we don't care what the citizens want, because it's not going to happen. Yeah, so if voting doesn't matter, then why vote? This government doesn't care what you want, doesn't care if it's your medicine, doesn't care if you're sick, doesn't care if you're a quadriplegic, even if you're a quadriplegic from the war. This government tortures, arrests, and jails sick people, its own citizens, is it any wonder why we arrest and torture people in Cuba or Iraq or any place else because they can? Wait a minute, isn't withholding medicine from those in custody a violation of the Geneva Convention, even in a Washington, D.C. jail? Of course it is. Well, we marijuana activists and practitioners of this ancient herb will overcome this evil regime eventually, but we have to use our power together. Look around at who we are. We are the people that go to Hemp Fest. We are the people that go to Hemp Stock. Look at these people that show up. We are the power. We vote. We spend money. Why are we putting up with being arrested, harassed, and overcharged for using anybody's medicine? Well, the short answer is we don't have to put up with it. We have to vote out people that arrest sick folks. Now, I hear, think I hear somebody out there saying, well, you're just a bunch of potheads. It's not really medicine. I'm sure some DEA agent is saying that. Well, it is medicine, and listen very carefully. If they can take my medicine away from me, they can take your medicine away from you, or make it so expensive you can't afford it. Wait, hasn't that already happened? I think so. And that's the way I see it tonight, right down here on Hemp Street. Thank you, Don. Yeah, it's ironic, you know, one of the leaders of uh, that Washington, D.C. initiative, which passed twice with over 65 percent, more than two-thirds of the vote, was mm -hmm. Bob Barr of Florida. Mm -hmm. Now, Bob Barr was defeated in 2004, and just last month he was hired by, unbelievably, the Marijuana Policy Project. And now Bob Barr, who helped stop medical marijuana in Washington, D.C., and was one of the most vociferous yes. opponents of marijuana legalization in Congress is now working, says he's discovered he was wrong and is a lobbyist for the Marijuana Policy Project. He's received an epiphany. Yep. 
Then you talked about Steve McWilliams of San Diego, who mm -hmm. passed away, you know, committed suicide in 2005. He's not to be confused with Peter McWilliams. They're not related. They're both just named McWilliams. Peter McWilliams died in 1999. He was on... Uh, He'd been growing medical marijuana and writing a book. He was a best-selling author. He wrote a wonderful libertarian book that was a, a, a t on the top bestseller list called Ain't Nobody's Business If You Do, and a dozen other best-selling self-help books. Anyway, Peter McWilliams was writing a book with uh, uh, some people in California when they were arrested. He got caught up in a federal conspiracy prosecution. They denied him the use of uh, cannabis. Uh, he's an AIDS patient taking dozens of uh, protease inhibitors and other things that are very difficult to keep down. And one night he was in a nausea bout and inhaled uh, his, his uh, uh, you know, bodily fluids and he died. He mm -hmm. suffocated in his bathroom and the judge would not allow him to use medical marijuana and consistently denied him the opportunity to do that. And I just figure that Los Angeles federal judge murdered this best-selling author, yes, Peter did. McWilliams. So there's a few points there for your edification. We have another caller. Hello, caller. You're on the show. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'm going to ask you a question you probably get asked a lot. Yeah, thanks now. for standing by there during our editorial here. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate your show and everything. Well, first of all, I've, um, I'm about 47 years old, uh -huh. and I've used marijuana for probably a good 40 years. Uh-huh. And, um, Sounds just like me, almost. Okay, yeah. And so you know, you know where it's at, and uh, you know, and I work, um, you know, high up construction and stuff. And um, it actually helps me uh, focus in on my job a lot better. Uh huh. Uh huh. And you know, calms my nerves and stuff. Because if you get up there high and you get scared, uh -huh. um, you're going to have problems. You know. Right. But the question I wanted to ask tonight was, and I'm sure you get it a lot, um, is on how I can obtain a uh, medical marijuana card? Well, you have to have one of the qualifying conditions. And the condition that most commonly qualifies is a chronic pain condition. Chronic pain from innumerable different conditions, everything from crushed vertebrae in the back to congenital deformities, hepatitis C, Many, many different things can constitute chronic and severe pain. So that's one condition. Others include AIDS or HIV, uh, spastic conditions, things that cause chronic and severe muscle spasms like multiple sclerosis or asthma is a spastic condition for which people can get medical marijuana. There's also uh, seizure disorders like epilepsy, neurodegenerative oh. diseases like ALS and Parkinson's and uh, gastrointestinal ailments like GERD, IBS, and, and Crohn's disease, in addition to glaucoma. So all of those conditions qualify for medical marijuana throughout the western United States. And in California, certain psychiatric conditions also qualify, but well, only I, in California. I do know that a lot of the kids in California have these cards and stuff now. And uh -huh, uh -huh. They're... Uh, Things are kind of getting strange down there with those clubs. You know, I went down to San Francisco with Mr. Tim Pate a few weeks ago, and we got the honor of hanging out in Willie Nelson's dressing room and watching him there. But, uh, you know, it's outrageously expensive. Those clubs are opening up everywhere. They're like little boutiques. They're charging 500 an ounce, which to me is outrageous. That's just, you know, it's more well over the price of gold. Yes, and I'm so... Sure. Uh, uh, it's I something it's that's that good, uh, uh, indica that was around quite a few years ago, but uh, <laughs> uh -huh. anyhow, you know, there's a movement here to set up dispensaries. I think we'll see an initiative uh, that uh, we're working on, along with Voter Power. It's been working on it a lot longer and harder than we have, but also the Marijuana Policy Project, and right. uh, uh, Oregon Normal's been working on a, a dispensary version that would be set up by the state as well. But I think we're going to see a dispensary initiative. I was in a conversation earlier today with a group of activists at a conference call. And it looks like uh, some funding's coming in on a, a national so, level to set up dispensaries so patients can have uh, access to legal medical marijuana through state well, licensed and supervised distributors. Where would be the best to go to get diagnosed for 
one of these elements to get the procedure going. Well, you have if to have a history, have a medical care, history. And if you have one of those medical histories, there are a variety of cannabis specialist doctors across the western United States that can help you. We know dozens of doctors across the state of California. In fact, we're taking over the practice of one of the first ones, Dr. Todd McCurria, later this month down in the San Francisco <laughs> Bay Area. We also have doctors across the state of Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Colorado, and Hawaii who can help patients get medical marijuana permits. So if you're in the Portland area and you need a doctor referral, you can call the number that's there on your screen. It's 503-235-4606. That's 503-235-4606. If you're up in Seattle, the number is 206-878-1701. That's 206-878-1701. If you're in Denver, Colorado, we have the show runs in Denver and in Seattle and here in Portland and other places too, including YouTube on the Internet. You can watch it anytime on YouTube. But in the city of Denver, you call that number. It's 303-403-9996. That's 303-403-9996. And if you're outside of these major metropolitan areas of Portland, Seattle, and Denver, you can call that other number right there. It's a toll-free number, 1-800-723-0188. 1-800-723-0188. Okay, I appreciate it and everything, and um, it certainly does help cut down on road rage. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. Thanks for, well, thanks. thanks Be careful out there. Uh, keep it up. Thank you. We shall. Okay. You know, we want to actually see marijuana completely legalized. Then we'll see medical marijuana become very, very inexpensive. I'd like mm -hmm. to see medical marijuana basically untaxed. The uh, initiative proposal that we're looking at here in Oregon for 2008 yes. would tax, uh, set up a state fee set up by the distributors. But I'd like to see medical marijuana untaxed and tax the sales to adults. People should be able to grow their own without taxes. I'd like to see industrial hemp uh, legalized without uh, debilitating restrictions around it. We want to restore that. So mm -hmm. you want to say anything in closing, Don? I'd like to say the DEA, mind your own business. Yeah, DEA, go away. That's what we like to say. Thank you for watching. Tune in next week and help us restore hip. Good night, Ramona. Thank you. folks. Thanks, Will, for coming in and playing tonight. We will try up.